So a big uh, welcome to you, Bronwyn, for giving up your time today on Saturday for our for our Aussie Live 2016. And we are happy to have you talk to us about gameful teaching practices. And I'm just going to give a little introduction to yourself and I'm sure that you'll fill in any gaps later on. The title is actually Sign of the Times. So I'm looking at the description in our community site. And uh, Bronwyn has been engaged in educational community and gameful practices for 15 years or more. And she's worked to explore virtual worlds, games in learning, and how we cultivate identity, agency, citizenship, leadership, and community. And Bronwyn does a lot of travelling, but we were just talking before that she's going to be staying closer to home in Australia this year, where she's the co-facilitator of Open Badges Australia and New Zealand. And she's been doing a lot of research into the use of Open Badges as well. Bronwyn is very happy for us to ask questions and to interact with her as we proceed through the session today. And welcome to our guests. We once again thank our sponsors. We have a couple of new ones this year for those who have just joined us and haven't known. Adult Learning Australia and Broadband for Seniors are our newest sponsors. We thank them for their support. And our, our team, of course, the Australia E-Series, have been with us for a long time. We thank them as well. We have Shambles with us today, as well as Ness, Joe, and Anne. The Learning Revolution, of course, without them, none of this would happen. And you'll find there's a little feedback form for you to fill in for the Learning Revolution. When you click on that, just select the Aussie Live session that you were in and give us some feedback. And of course, all of our rooms are Blackboard Collaborate. And we're testing them out to the full here today. We've got loaded videos and loaded images for you. We'll see how we go. So once again, just select your little smiley face and place it on the world map for us to see where you all are. If you're on a mobile device, of course, that's not possible. So you might like to just text in where you are currently located as I thought, <laughs> Chambles is in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And we have Ben with us today. And Ben is another person that I think you should team up with Bronwyn. Maybe you already know one another. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your location. So now we move to the sign of the times. So over to you, Bronwyn. Okay, thanks so much, Carol, and thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, I'm going to try and leave the video on, but if it's too much because I'm too distracting, um, I'm, I'm sensing a little bit of lag on it. I don't know if other people are. Um, I'm happy to drop it um, out and we can just see the still. But yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe drop the video now. Okay, great. So. That's me waiting here from Sydney. Okay, and I'm going to be talking today about um, why I think it's a sign of the times in terms of gamefulness in learning. And as Carol said, I invite you to ask a question um, whenever you feel like it, and we'll stop there and have a bit of a conversation. Because this is, um, I really believe it takes a village, and I'm here as much to hear from you as I am to um, tell you about what I've been learning. So I, on the screen you should be able to see, I, I apologise if these slides have displayed very small. Um, they came in because I do my work in Keynote, that, that I uploaded them as JPEGs and they came in on pages, which is a bit odd, but there you go. But I have a link I will give you to all the slide deck um, afterwards if you want any of the material. So you will get access to all of that and some further work and activity and fun together. But on the screen you can see to the left and the right two images of play that most K-12 classroom teachers at least would readily recognise, you know. Physical play and um, tabletop games, board games 
And then digital games came along um, in, in the scene and that's represented there by the Creeper from Minecraft. Um, and teachers have understood games in those other formats um, very well and knew how to bring them into their curriculum and have used math games, science games, all kinds of puzzles and activities. But when digital games came to play, we kind of fallen behind in our um, use of these kinds of tools. And so we're going to have a look at some of the cool stuff that's happening and how teachers can recognise where it might be a good place to bring gamefulness, digital gamefulness into your curriculum. And when I talk of gamefulness, I do not want to suggest for any, in any way that being digital is more important than those physical and um, other kinds of games. I think play in itself is um, a, a much undervalued learning experience. And so um, very much when I'm talking about gamefulness, I really want us to think about all the ways we can be gameful. But we're focusing on digital because that's the one teachers kind of have missed out a little bit on. Now I've got a digital page for us um, where we can share information and indeed where you can download the slide deck and other things. Um, and it's that, it's in a, a OneNote, so it's aka.ms slash get game on. And um, you can jump into that and if I'm boring you can be talking away there. Um, adding content or games or ideas um, or um, join in after the event. Um, and so to those of you who are listening, um, then you can jump in and uh, after the event add questions, which I will come back and answer. And you'll see there are some there already. Um, so um, it's a way of us taking this one hour and breaking down the limits of the hour and making it something bigger. And I also want to tell you about I'm going to be doing um, some case studies of educational contexts and people getting involved in gamefulness for the first time. And, you know, that's not about the first wave of early adopters in using games and game-based learning and gamification, but it's about that next wave of people that will help make things mainstream. And I'm doing case studies of those people because from my um, communities of practice background and research, we know that probably the best person to teach a novice is someone who was most recently a novice. And so hearing the stories of people who have just moved into doing this, why they did it, how they're going, what strategies did they put in place, how did they get their um, students engaged, how did they get per, um, parents and leadership engaged, those are the stories that people in that next wave need to hear. And if you're one of those people, here's the quid pro quo in that document, aka.ms slash get game on. Um, if you want to add that, I'll contact you and I'm offering a half day free consulting to your school in terms of games or game based research um, in, 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 in exchange for telling your story. So, you know, it's a chance for me to come into your school, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that researcher that's using your experience. I want to help add to the experience if I can. So that's, um, that's the gift I want to give people who contact me. So if, that, if that's something that interests you, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Okay, so moving on, and I'm hoping these slides are still kind of readable. Um, we want to take a moment to think about what fun is. And maybe if you're on Twitter, you might want to tweet that out um, in terms of got game on or get game on, doesn't matter, I've used both. Um, what do you think fun is? And if online, you might just put that in the chat. Now, how would you describe fun? An alien landed from space, what would you tell them was fun? What is fun? How do we engage in fun? How do we know we're having fun? What is it that tells us um, that we're in, we're having fun, we're in a fun experience. Please don't be shy in the chat. So Peggy George says, something I enjoy but others might not. Yes, absolutely. Faces united naturally. Yes, there's a lot of uh, body language about fun. Creative and lighthearted playfulness. Smiles and laughter. Giggles.
Okay, so look, that sounds like a lot of very pleasurable experiences. Um, and I think we want to step back a little bit and think about that's part of the reason people criticise games in schools because they see kids as just having, and you could, if you had me on video, you'd see me doing finger quotes, fun. And I want to suggest to you that we need to think much deeper about what fun is and it's not always an entirely pleasurable experience. And so I want to bring up Nicole Lazaro's research work. She's an American game designer and researcher and really worth following. Um, and she's proposed the four keys to fun. Hard fun, which is um, a concept actually out of Seymour Papert's um, work when he was talking to a child and the child had been doing something really difficult, he said to the child, well, how would you describe what you've been doing? And he said, it was hard fun. And um, I think that's a great concept. I think, you know, when Rafael Nadal wins a championship, he's probably had hard fun. Um, he's experienced personal triumph. Um, and when you describe that kind of fun, it includes a lot of frustration and aggression and anger and, you know, it's not always necessarily a whole lot of really positive feelings that get you there. Um, but the sense at the end um, is, is something highly pleasurable. So hard fun, easy fun, that's the curiosity. And those, anyone who's listening or watching this who's you know, an early childhood educator would absolutely watch easy fun every day watching kids and their natural curiosity to test things out and tinker with things and explore things. Serious fun is what we do for relaxation and excitement, where we plan some kind of fun um, that we're going to engage in. And then people fun, which is our amusements with each other, our social activity that is fun. So there are a lot of elements to fun. It's not just about um, smiles and giggles, although smiles and giggles are very important. So I, I think that's the thing we need to get across is that fun has a lot of words to describe it. And I, I like to think of um, the different ways you can use games in learning as infusions. So if you think about infusions, if you're like me, I'm a, a bit of a red singer. Fan, um, but you know, different tea infusions or herbal infusions that you might use, they all come in different flavours, but then you can have different intensities in terms of how you infuse them. So there are flavours and then there are intensities. And that's the way we need to start thinking about games in learning. And so I want to propose these three categories. Um, there's a really nice blog post from an American teacher colleague of mine, Steve Isaacs, um, that really well cuts to what I'm going to say here. So the use of game infusions, there's the places where we use game design for learning. So where we're getting students or teachers to design games to create learning experiences. And I've put a, link, a picture there of um, Spark, uh, which is Project Spark, which is one of the Microsoft games um, where students are using to find tools to create very high level, very sophisticated games online. Um, so that's game design. Then there's game based learning. And game based learning is quite different because you're not designing the game. You're going to bring games into your curriculum. So you might recognise an attribute of physics and you may wish to bring in Zoom, the ABC Splash game, into your curriculum. So game-based learning is about bringing existing games into your curriculum to meet curriculum needs. And they might come in at the beginning, they might come in at the end, there might be an introduction, there might be an assessment tool. There may be any number of those things, but it's bringing a game into your classroom. And the question there from Shambles, is it actually possible to have a game that does not facilitate learning? And I think Jim G, and I probably agree that it's no. It depends what you're learning. Um, and part of the thing I'm going to say today is, as educators, we don't want to sit around and wait for the educational game that we need to be creating. We need to be looking around at a lot of the off-the-shelf games to look at how we can bring them in and adapt them into our curriculum. 
So, you know, I think uh, Jim Drew suggests that game designers actually know more about learning than we do as educators because they get players to do very hard things for very long periods of time for very little reward per, uh, other than their um, motivation in the game. So the, the way games are designed is an engagement science in itself. So, and the third area is game-inspired learning, and I prefer the term game-inspired instead of gamification, only because gamification carries a bit of baggage these days because um, everything's been gamified, and it means like slapping a few points and a few badges onto something and saying, okay, we gamified the experience. Um, and there's less of a tolerance for that. I think people will exhaust their interest in that quite quickly. But really well-crafted gamification is, um, is very powerful and really does motivate and give learners reputation, recognition, um, lots and lots of engagement benefits. So the way you can look at those is um, game design for learning is engagement through design. So your level of engagement is heightened through using a design tool to design a game. So when students are given a challenge in, to design a game that might teach something um, or to demonstrate something, they have to learn a lot about that something, whatever it is, to design the game. And then go and design and use design tools. There may be, as the current trend is learning some coding along the way, lots of really cool things that can be folded in that. But more excitingly than that, I love the teamwork, the leadership, the um, collaboration that goes when kids are in teams, when students of any age are in teams designing a game. And they might be designing a board game, and they could be using digital tools to design a digital game. Game-based learning is engagement through game play. So they're engaging through the play with a concept. Um, in the first one, they're designing through design. They're engaging through design. In game-based learning, they're engaging through play. So it's bringing games into the curriculum. In game-inspired learning, it's guided by, it's engagement guided by game atoms. So you're mapping a gameful approach to your curriculum. You're not turning your curriculum into a game, but you're bringing in some atoms of game that may be adapted into your curriculum. So those are the three distinctions I want to make, and I think are fairly important. Lots of people lump them all together and call them gamification, and that's absolutely not correct. Gamification is that third area. Um, I like game infusion, which is a term that comes from Professor Sasha Barab out of Arizona State University Center for Games and Impact. Um, these are infusions of game that you can have in your classroom. And that's a classroom K to grey, you know, academic, TAFE, and I'm going to show you examples of a whole lot of those. So game design for learning, um, and I have a few videos, we'll see how successful it is showing these, but um, they are linked in the slide deck when you, uh, and, and I will put the links into that um, OneNote uh, for you to collect if they don't work too well here. But this is a game that was designed by students in the Australian STEM Video Game Challenge. Have, have any of you heard of that challenge? Yes, no? Yay, thanks, Ness. Um, yeah, but it's run by ACER. It's a fantastic challenge. It's opening again this year quite soon. And students um, design a game to teach a STEM concept or a STEM-related concept. And it has a lot of categories, great prizes. The kids are associated with industry experts. And their game is judged by people from the game, the game design industry. Fantastic stuff. And hopefully I'll be able to play this first video um, just to give you a sense. Now, this has no sound, so I'll be able to talk over it. But you'll see a game designed about um, saving dolphins and glitter. And this was designed by students um, in year nine from Callaghan College in Queensland. Go Queensland. And it tells me some, some of you may not have received this full media, so you know, don't, don't worry, I won't spend a lot of time in it. But what you're seeing actually is some level of the gameplay where the dolphins are trying to navigate um, 
through the uh, littered ocean and navigating oil spills and all sorts of other things. And you're hoping to get the dolphin to uh, to navigate through that. And, and the idea there is to reinforce um, the notion of um, caring about our oceans and what we litter ends up in our oceans. And I can hear people are having problems with the video, so I'm going to stop and jump, keep going um, through, um, and I will give you the links to the videos later. So this is a really abject lesson. There were fantastic games presented, um, and indeed a student who presented his game and was a winner in the 2004 14, the inaugural STEM Video Game Challenge, has since been picked up by a game design company and his, his game is going into production. And that was, I think, at that stage he was a year 10, 9 or 10 student. Um, so these game competitions really raise the level for kids, but the content that's inside them is wonderful. You can tell what children had to learn to design the game. So that's something I would highly recommend people take a look at. Moving on, you know, I won't bother with videos from now on because it seems a little problematic, but I'll put, make sure you've got access, them, access to them on that um, OneNote. Escape Tomorrow was a game designed by students at the Elizabeth Morrow School in New, New Jersey. And um, what happens there is the students designed a game using Minecraft, uh, where you had to escape this Earth, which is now doomed, but you had to collaborate to build a rocket ship and gather enough resources by mining in Minecraft and, and you know, growing food and collecting food and cutting down trees and whatever. Um, and as a team, um, set up your rocket and leave this planet. And they designed the game in order to have other kids around the world play it. And so they've put their game online and other students can download that map to play it in Minecraft. And then they invite teachers from around the world to use their game in their classrooms and then come back and tell them how, the, how they survived. How did they go? You know, what modifications would they like to make to the game? How would they extend the game? And so they're starting to build a little community around the game they created. So um, it's a really um, lovely concept of kids sharing out what they've designed. And they had to learn a lot about survival. What would you need to take from Earth? And using the limited resources of Minecraft demonstrate that. And we're talking about students here in the um, years three to six of school. So we're not talking about um, very um, elder statesmen of schooling. Then there's a program here I'm going to show you. It's a commercial game, and it is free to school. Um, it's an iPad game, so if you're in working with iPads or, or um, other um, tablet devices, called Water Bears. And the EDU game is free to, free to educational organisations. Now, I play this myself as a little mind diversion. It starts off very simple, um, but it's really um, a systems thinking game. And what happens is you have to those cute little water bears and they're all different colours and you have to build systems that will feed them the appropriate water from um, different pipes and tanks and you have lots of different views. Um, if you do nothing else out of today, I want you to jump on to um, the App Store or Google Play and download um, Water Bears and play it because it is a fantastic game. And kids, are, it's very extensible. Kids of all ages could be using it. So again, this is game-based learning. This is bringing a game into your classroom that could be used in, in furthering the concept of systems thinking. Yes, absolutely, Coach Carol. Tell your um, students about um, water beds. Okay, so game-based learning. We've looked there at um, game design was kids making games. And then game-based learning is bringing games into your classroom. There's another game I want to tell you about, and I had a beautiful video for this, but I'm not going to worry about playing it. You can download it later. Um, Never Alone. Now, this is a game designed uh, by a company called Elo Media, and they partnered with the Inupiaq peoples in Alaska 
to create a game, um, a culturally sensitive game that told their stories. Now the hero of this you know, game is a little girl, which is uh, something I, all of us love to see. It's a culturally rich game, and, but it's a very visually beautiful game. It's a very high class game, uh, you know, platformer style of game. And kids learn um, about the Inupiaq culture and it's a, a game that's been approved by elders of the community. Um, the beautiful graphics uh, are not an, a literal demonstration of um, their culture, but it's meant to give you a sense of their, their culture and community through um, modern graphic style. It's really beautiful, very rich. It is a commercial game, but if a school was investing it, or if you're thinking of presents for uh, children or grandchildren, this is a really beautiful game to consider. Um, and since they developed this, as I said, it was a partnership with the actual um, tribal council in Alaska. Since that, the company has been asked to look at producing games perhaps for Aboriginal culture here in Australia, First Nations cult culture in Canada um, and different cultural groups because it's such a beautiful game and, t and stories told so sensitively. Um, so a great game to go and have a look at how the, what the real quality of game-based learning can be. And I better scoot along. And it's won a lot of awards. And then there's game inspired learning. Um, what age group Anne asks for? Um, I would say it's probably um, 8 through to 14 maybe, um, depending on the kids um, and you know, what experience they have in playing games. I think it's a great game if you're going to do game design to show children what visually beautiful content looks like. Um, and, and you know how, how what you can aspire to in game design. I think it's a, a class act. And did I miss any other questions? I'm really keen if you have a question that I don't miss. So I'm just scrolling back a quick sec. Okay, I don't think I have, but hit me over the head if I have. And then there's game inspired learning, and that's the space I currently work in particularly in um, schools and professional learning contexts. So I'm looking at doing, I'm doing um, game inspired community work with Intel and Microsoft's Minecraft community and other groups. And game inspired learning, as I said, it's bringing atoms of game into your classroom. So in the left picture, um, and I know this is displaying quite small for you, um, uh, it's just three simple recycle bins, thinking about recycling, put a basketball hoop over them, you've added a bit of a game at them, and you get kids thinking each time they throw a piece of litter towards that, what are they aiming for? Which one? Which one are they going to be putting their litter in? Um, we've all seen, I think most of us have seen that video with the staircase that was turned into a piano where people bounced up and down the stairs um, to encourage people not to use the escalator but to take the steps. So they turn the steps into a piano and as you step on each step, it plays a note and so you can run up and down the steps and make music. That's, that's gamifying it. That's giving a fun element, that's an element of game brought into um, the activity. Uh, the second one you can see is in a park and it, all it is is setting up the angle so you can readily see with a protractor um, what's happening um, when, you're, when you're playing on a swing. And there are other graphics for the similar ones where you can do it on the floor so that when you open a door you can read the angle as you open the door and it just gets people to play with the experience of okay, what's 15 degrees, what's 90 degrees, what's you know 130 degrees. And then the third one is um, a lovely one I found on Facebook um, which is, okay, you got grounded and it's um, Cassidy has been grounded and she's been given a list of things and the number of points she needs to earn with each to get ungrounded. And the things on that list are, um, and she gets to choose, so she's making up a certain number of points, but there are lots of options there. So that's part of the point of what's important about gamification is you need to open up broader options and you need to give people choice and agency for it to work. So in each of these examples, 
it's not gainful unless the person chooses to engage in it, unless they opt in. And opting in is really important. They don't have to, but they can if they want to. And so for Cassidy, the things on the list, which you can't see, but you will if you download the slide set, um, they're family things. They're not just chores, but it's things that would be fun to do as well. Um, so it's not just getting your kids to put the bin out or, um, or you know, hoover the floor. It's, it's about other things that are family oriented, helping your little brother do something or, uh, you know, uh, sitting with your family and talking about your day. Um, so it's bringing things that you might think are important and that's an element of gamefulness that's very important in, ga in gamification. You need to surface what is important. What do you want people to engage with? What's the core thing that's really important? And you make that worth a lot. Um, and so if you're going to do a points and badges system, then the things you really want people to, to consider are the, the most valued of the points and things in your system. So a lot of game, gamification is built on what's called self-determination theory. And, and if, it's got it, if you've got it right, it's, it's about autonomy, response, response, responsibility and relationships. Um, and so people have to have agency, they have to have connections, they have to have um, responsibility and reputation. The next one is um, a fun game, and this is out of a community college in the United States, a, a fun gamified practice from Professor Amy Baskin. And um, it's very low tech, it's in physical, it's in a hall, and they, um, I have a great video for that, but I can't show it, I don't think. Um, but what happened is to students in community college, many of them are aspiring to get into mainstream college in the United States. Uh, uh, for, for a number of different reasons, um, they've missed out on some aspects of their learning. And grammar is one that's particularly um, poor. And one that's vitally important if they want to get into, into mainstream college or further learning, they need to really get a handle on the grammar. Uh, and so she created this Grammar Olympics which took aspects of grammar from the boring learning the antecedent and, and whatever else, nouns, verbs, adjectives, to um, game, a gameful day where they took over the hall and they made all these different games, each game related to some aspect of grammar. Now she's teaching 16, 17, 18 year olds and in the video you'll hear them talk about um, how fun it was, because at the end, if they complete their Olympics card, they get a gold medal. And these kids were like, oh, well, you know, they really wanted a gold medal. Um, and I know a lot of people talk about intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. And I think um, for a lot of cases in gamification, it's more of a side issue. Because who would think 17-year-olds would really invest in a day to get a, a, a fake gold medal? But they did, and it wasn't their whole grammar program. But what it was designed to do was to get them over the hump of thinking grammar wasn't fun, grammar wasn't important, grammar wasn't something they needed to engage in. And so this day is, mo is to motivate them and get them thinking about the things they already know and the things they don't know and recognising where their weaknesses might be. And so they had tutors on site during the days, they played through all the different games um, and the whole academic team pulled together to develop the game. And the video is pretty powerful with the kids talking about how much fun it was getting things right and, and you know, achieving and competing against each other over grammar. So um, it's a really lovely piece of work. So that's game-inspired learning. This is one I used with Microsoft last year, um, was a sheet for the actual um, presentation during the day, and we just put some fun things into a, a, a chart for people, and they had to choose what they were going to aim to get. So did you want to go aim for 100 points out of today? And there was space at the bottom of the chart for you to write the things you came to get out of today. What did you come to get? and you put those in the bottom. And then you made a choice about how many points you wanted to earn out of today. And then you check them off as you went along. 
as you achieved each of the things there. And there's fun things like when someone says something that really resonates with you, I want you to jump up and scream bazinga to the whole room. And so, you know, there's um, an element of being silly that's very important in gamefulness. And so throwing in some of those things was really important. Bring someone else a cup of coffee could earn you some points. So it wasn't just focused on the content of the day but the sociable um, aspects of the day, fun elements of the day and collaborative learning aspects of the day. Um, and so, you know, those are sorts of things we can readily do at our professional learning days and conferences. So that's game inspired learning and I hope you're getting a sense of the difference between game design, game based learning and game, um, game inspired learning. And then there's Minecraft and what would any presentation on gamefulness be without the obligatory mention of Minecraft. Um, and the interesting thing here is in different ways Minecraft fits across all of these areas. You can use it, as I showed you with the Escape Tomorrow um, game, as a design tool. You can bring it in as a game-based learning tool and you can use it for gamification. So it fits across a whole lot of um, other areas. And I'm going to charge through because I think Minecraft already it has enough press. But it's a really beautiful tool and it's very exciting because it's so adaptable. Now one of the things we need to think about is if, if you want to bring a gameful approach into your teaching and learning, whether that's in K6, K12, TAFE or, um, or academic um, tertiary education in university, how would you start? Where would you start? And I'm going to suggest there we look for the signals of a need to revamp, rethink, revise what we're doing. And the first of those signals is the topic signal. So if a topic is not intrinsically interesting um, or engaging, then that might be a really great place to start. If it's something you have to teach but it's really not the most exciting topic, the naturally exciting topic in the suite, that might be a great place to start to think about um, getting gameful. And you saw that with the Grammar Olympics, uh, you know, bringing games in, making games up, getting gamified with the Grammar Olympics was a way to get students to engage with grammar in a different way, to get over their resistance to wanting to learn about it. Then there's the learner signals the need. And you may have learners that are very switched off. Um, we failed them because I don't think kids fail or learners fail or students fail, I think our system fails them. We haven't engaged them enough, we haven't given them enough autonomy or agency and we haven't found their passion. And so when students are traditionally turned off by the learning, that might be a great place to start. So if you've got a set of students who are um, not doing so well and I know for instance, um, Brendan Jones, who teaches on the Central Coast in New South Wales, um, has been um, working with a project in game design with students at risk in, um, in the school environment, high school environment, um, at risk of dropping out of school and using a, a kind of a leak game design program to get those kids excited about learning. Because if you get them excited about one area, a lot of that bleeds over into the other areas of their learning. But we need to get them back into being excited about learning. There's where the engagement signals a need. So um, giving learners new experience of success and that's pretty closely aligned to the learner signal but I'm going to show you some examples in a minute. And then there's the context signal where you're about to reform some aspect of the curriculum and that may be very important with the national curriculum. If you're about to reform some aspect of your curriculum, that's a beautiful time to think about gamifying it um, in some way, uh, to think about making it gameful. Because, um, you know, if, you're, if it's up for grabs and you're going to rethink the assumptions that underlie um, your curriculum, then that's a perfect time to think about doing it in a different way. 
Do you think this would work in undergrad? Absolutely would work in undergraduate courses as well. And I'm going to recommend a program um, called, and you can Google it, you'll find it quite readily, Quest to Teach, which will show you um, not Quest to Learn, which is Katie Salen's program. The Quest to Teach is out of Arizona State University. It's in pre-service teaching. Um, and they've developed some virtual world games where students engage through the virtual game in the practice of teaching. Um, and they do this while they're actually out in practice experiences in schools. Um, and so they're playing while they're out in a school. Well, in, in America, in, in Arizona at least, um, it, that's the la whole last year of their four-year degree they spend in school. Um, and it starts off with some very fun, simple things like um, being professional. What does that mean? You know, that's turning up on time, dressing professionally, all the attributes of being a professional. But it gets quite difficult quite um, into the, the subsequent games where students are looking at, at personalised programs and personalised feedback. In, in different aspects. And that, that's a really, Quest to Teach is a really beautiful program. Um, Anna, Dr. Anna Barab, um, Anna Barab is the person you might want to contact there if anyone's interested in having a look at that. And I know they um, have research partners all over the world using it in their teacher programs. Uh, was that the university? Yes, that was the university that started and uh, well, Quest Atlanta started in Indiana University with Sasha Barab, and Anna was on the design team there doing research. Um, and then Sasha went to Arizona, and they subsequently went on to develop Atlantis Remixed, which is a, a game version rather than a virtual world version of that material. And then Quest to Teach, which is the um, undergraduate program. Um, being used in their teacher education program at Arizona State. But it gives you a very clear idea and indeed people in health education that saw the game said, oh wow, this is fantastic, we would love to be using this to teach health practices. So because their particular games teach practices, so you get to experience practices, you get to play them over, you get to, get to test what happens if you make a different choice in, in the scenarios? And it's all done in a very fun and playful way. But it has consequences. So if your feedback to students isn't effective, then you know there are there are consequences that will happen. Um, and so other faculties at the university and other places where they've demonstrated the game have said, that's fantastic, that's what we'd really love to think about doing. Um, and so, you know, different Aid programs are looking at the same kind of infrastructure to, to, to design a game for their their areas. So exciting stuff. So that's um, the context where you've got a context. It's going to be reformed. Why not think about where to bring in gamefulness? So the first one. Um, yeah, well, you don't explode kids because that's kind of not quite fun, even though we've all been there, um, but uh, but you do have things where, you know, you have consequences within the bounds of decorum in, in your school. Um, so the topic signals in the coding is really exciting at the moment. Um, it's the thing we're being told is the second most important language and I think that's actually quite arguable. Um, but it is proving to be something that's an integral part of systems thinking. It isn't necessarily an appealing thing to learn and it's certainly not something that's in most teachers' remit. Um, most of us don't have the experience to teach it. So it comes along something like um, the hour of code and you can bring in the games from the Star Wars hour of code. You've got the Minecraft hour of code activities. There's the Angry Birds, which is my favourite, Angry Birds hour of code activities. where Kids even as young as four can be learning the principles, the early principles of coding. And they're there all year even though the hour of code runs in late November. Um, there are lots of things there that could get you started. There are games you can bring into your curriculum. So game-based learning you can bring into your curriculum to stimulate an interest in coding. 
Yeah, great point about what's already out there. You need to know what's out there to think about what you might leverage or work on or who you could partner with. So if you're interested in, in approaching a game and saying we'd like this or we'd like it adapted for XYZ, then maybe you could be partnering with someone to develop a new version of the game. So this is where the topic signals a need. Coding um, is a great way to start, but where do you go? Okay, well, here's some activities. Now, where the learner signals a need, and this is a um, piece of work from my dear friend, Natalie Denmead, and she is amazing. If you do not know Natalie, then please Google her, hunt her down. If you want to do anything gamified, particularly in the tape sector, um, she or, or using Moodle, she's Moodle Muse on um, on Twitter. Um, she is is awesome, absolutely, Carol. And she has students who are um, switched off. They've come to TAFE. They haven't had success in school. They kind of wandered along to TAFE. She has a brilliant subject, so they're learning media studies. Um, Great topic. They're motivated to do the topic, but these kids, um, these young people, they're not kids, these young people have had um, a pretty tragic set of experiences around learning. They don't want to get out of bed in the morning. They're not motivated to just kind of do really well. And she created this program she called the Velvet Throne, which was a competition. She put the students into houses and guilds and they had responsibilities. They earned points and badges during each week of the program. And they were responsible for each other in their team. So for instance, points were as simple as getting to class on time. If your whole team was in class before the lesson started, then you got points for that towards um, your goals for the being the winning team, the winning house for the week. Um, by the way, the beautiful visuals in this are all student work. So Natalie, was, this is very much participatory design because she was working along with the students to design it. Um, she only had the first week or two thought up and then the students worked with her to design the competition beyond um, that. And so, you know, she, she saw marked difference in the students' behaviour and their disposition towards coming to class um, which was fascinating, but also fabulous, because these are talented young people who really can aspire to do well, and um, and they were worked really brilliantly. As an aside, just to tell you how awesome Natalie is, she um, she's you know invest very heavily in her students, and she actually managed to get a, um, a prize for the winning house um, to go to the Weta Studios in Wellington in New Zealand to look at professional multimedia development. Um, and she didn't know that when she set out the program, but it did turn out in the end. Um, and you know, she's the kind of person who would find that and work to find that prize for her students. But her work is fantastic. And that's gamification. That's bringing in those attributes of game into your curriculum. But here, the learner signals the need. If we're looking at uh, engagement signals the need, girls in STEM is a big one. Girls in science, technology, engineering and math is a really important one. And that's um, me teaching, a gosh awful picture of me teaching um, with some young girls at um, the Big Day Inn in um, Hilltop Road Primary School here in Sydney last year. Now the Big Day Inn brings engineering, math and science activities into schools and traditionally they've worked in universities. Then they brought the program down to high schools and students engage all day moving around different activities from universities and, and engaging in STEM principles. Um, this was the first year that the foundation has brought the big day in into a primary school. And so we focused, and some of this is the focus on girls. And these, these young ladies had never used um, the, the actual, actual activity was redesigning an attribute of their school in Minecraft. Um, and so that was, that's where engagement signals the need. Girls in education, we have a need there. Let's bring them some exciting aspects to their learning that will get them engaged. And least, last but definitely not 
least is where the context signals the need. And I want to put a plug out here for not just using educational games. Um, many of you will know The Walking Dead as a television series, and there is a game, The Walking Dead. Um, and um, a, a teacher in uh, the Netherlands uses um, no, Netherlands, yes, I think it's Netherlands or Nor no, Norway. Sorry, uses um, The Walking Dead to teach ethics. Would you believe in his classroom? He teaches that's his subject, ethics. Now they were thinking about revising their curriculum. How would they do it in an engaging way? Well, what they do is they get the students to play the first level of The Walking Dead. And these are 16 year olds. We're not talking about very young children, it's high school. And so they play through the Walking Dead game and the, at the first level. And then they learn different sets of ethical principles. They talk about them, they discuss them, and they choose one set of ethical principles out of the curriculum and they play the next level according to that set of principles and then they discuss and debrief. Now the power is not necessarily in the game. The power is in the discourse that surrounds the game. And so you can bring an off the shelf game as long as it's appropriate um, for the level or age of the students um, in and you can have that vibrant conversation. You can imagine how juicy the conversation was about ethics when the kids were trying to apply certain sets of ethical principles to something as Bizarre is the walking dead. And they're talking about that afterwards. Um, so pretty powerful stuff. I think it's um, really important, um, and I apologise that I didn't know, I offered, I'm only a senior moment, can't remember the name of my colleague, but I will put his name in the, um, in the OneNote so that you will know who to follow up on for that to have a look at how this was done. So don't wait around for the educational game to be designed. You can be designing or bringing gamefulness into your classroom from what already exists or inventing it like naturally yourself. There are lots of different ways to bring it in um, without waiting. And, and to be honest, most educational games really suck. They're not very good um, and kids won't want to play beyond the first level. Learners don't want to play beyond the first level because they're not good games. So as I said, I'm looking for classroom cases um, of, of people interested in um, telling their story of how they got involved in um, gamefulness in their school or in their classroom or in their club or whatever educational context. Maybe it's a library. Um, lots of fabulous things are happening these days in terms of gamefulness in public libraries and in school libraries. Um, so. Um, I'm really interested in, and you'll see in that document there's a place to put your name if you'd like me to contact you after this session. Um, as I said, the, and if you're listening into this session at a later date or watching the recording, um, please don't hesitate to do so because, as I said, I, the quid pro quo is um, I'll come into your school and give you half a day consulting um, on what you might be wanting to do if I get to tell your story um, and just have a little interview with you about how you got started or how your school got started. Um, in the doc, yes, you do need to, you'll see edit in browser and you just click that and then you can um, edit it. So it's kind of like a, a Google Doc that you've all been invited to come in and, and, uh, and work on. So there's a few little fun things in there if you want to follow up. If you have a question after today, um, please um, leave it there and I'll try and answer it. You'll see there's a couple already gone in. And one of the schools there, Shireen um, Win Winrow from Redlands has already contacted me and I'm um, doing a story on the work happening in her school. Um, so. Yeah, I'm looking for cases across the sector and not just in Australia, so global. Um, if you know of a school that's getting started, I don't want to tell the stories of the grand experts because they've already been told. We need to hear the stories of the new people moving into this space um, who um, haven't yet been told. So, and are there any other questions?
especially I'll when people sure get very shy. Links. I'll make sure the video links and any other links are all in that doc so you'll have access to them. And the, the whole screen set is linked already so you could download it. Um, oh, what do I think the question future for you? <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, the virtual stuff, you know, uh, Oculus Rift headsets and all of that is very exciting. Um, I mean, a lot of the colleagues I know in the game, game, game form gaming world, I met in Second Life. So um, I, we, we very much understand how the real and the virtual or the physical and the virtual integrate. So I'm very excited by that, that virtual experience and, and how you can be using that. But I'm also very excited by augmented reality games where kids are out designing games in the environment. I've seen some fantastic games like that out of um, the American Museum of Natural History in New York um, looking at um, augmented reality uh, where you enter certain, they have decks of cards and they have the holographic and they bring up content or you enter certain parts of the museum and um, you know experience are triggered Thank on you. your tablet or iPhone. Um, so I think augmented reality, virtual reality, those are all very exciting. But I still think physical play is very exciting and fun in designing, you know, board games and all those kind of games. I think we need to be looking at a gamut of what's appropriate for who we're dealing with. Um, I'm, I think coding is a means to an end. I think computational thinking is where we need to focus, not coding. Um, and computational thinking and systems thinking is much bigger than just learning to code, um, much and all as we might all love Python. Um, I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff there. So, Absolutely. Um, I, I'm just looking um, at anyone, some of the text. Sorry? I'm just looking back into the text to see if there are any questions that we missed. I mean, and this is pretty serious stuff too. I know IBM is using a lot of virtual world gaming for its employees and, and managers. Um, different really high profile large companies around the world are developing their own um, knowledge systems with gameful approaches to them. Um, I saw a beautiful virtual world last year at the Serious Games or Serious Play Conference and uh, it was teaching team collaboration for um, industry teams and uh, it was really beautifully set up and had a lot of psychometric material behind it and I think that's something else. Gamefulness produces a lot of data and we need to learn how to use that big data um, because there's a lot of information in the background that's being spat out by playing games that we can leverage to know more about our learners, to know more about the content, to know more about their engagement. Um, so I think, you know, it sounds strange to think you've got on one end playfulness and on the other end this, this sort of heaviness of big data, but I think there's a, a marriage there in the kinds of games and activities we're going to see coming up. I'm mindful of the time. Um, absolutely leave me a question and um, I'm on Twitter at BronST and on Facebook and everywhere else you can find me. Um, and you know if you want to leave questions anywhere or contact me privately if you want to do a fault be a case study or you have a colleague who's working and you think oh that would be really helpful for them. And I will travel so I'm doing looking at some quite rural schools to come and visit. So don't think just if your school is rural or your um, your college is rural that it's not worth saying you'd like to um, get involved. Um, I'm prepared to come. This is my year of hanging out much more in Australia as Carol said. Normally I'm spending quite a bit of time overseas but this year I'm, um, I want to get in amongst all the juicy stuff going on in my own country. <laughs> Absolutely and people want you there too Ron. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful session today.
we really love the fast-paced notion of your gameful teaching practices and thank you for all of the links and I believe that you'll be putting the links to those videos into the OneDrive doc, is that correct? Uh, absolutely, I'll do that immediately when I get off this session. Oh, wonderful, thank you so much. I think a round of applause in the virtual way or in the actual way. Thank We're you. very, very proud to have you and the Aussie Live 2016 and we hope that you'll come back again. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. For thanks for having me totally and thanks to anyone who's listening to this down the track. Great to have you. I, I'm often the person who has to get to the recording because I couldn't make the live session so totally understand. <laughs> Thank you for that. We've had some brilliant presentations all day and uh, we have to announce that the final one for today unfortunately has needed to be cancelled um, due to a modem crash with that presenter. So today's session with Bron marks the end of our Saturday presentations but we'll be back tomorrow with another round of very interesting presentations and another keynote which will end the sessions tomorrow will be on at one o'clock. So we do hope that we'll come back, you will be able to come back tomorrow. Thank you everyone for attending. I'll now close the recording. Thanks everybody. Bye.